Hello, I'm Paul Foster from Contact Renovation to Custom Homes and welcome to the Art of Renovation Live. This week we are talking with Jerry Dixon from Iconic Cabinets about all things to do with kitchen design. We spoke with Jerry for in our first episode but we had a technical glitch and uh, didn't record it. So here we go again and we have some really good information from Jerry so uh, it's worth certainly talking about and if you're considering a kitchen renovation there are some things here you need to think about uh, well in advance of buying your cabinets, planning your layouts, etc. So I'll get to introducing Jerry. Uh, before I do that, we'll talk about our giveaway this week. So um, Jerry, um, in conjunction with Marathon Hardware, giving away free cabinet handles for your kitchen. So we'll have a draw today at the end of the show. Um, and then to enter into the draw, you need to comment on where Iconic Cabinets builds their cabinets. And we'll get an answer for you here soon and then enter that in the comment to be entered into the draw. Anyhow, so Jerry Dixon, he started in cabinetry back with a company called Sunak and they worked with some of the biggest designers in the world. So he's uh, done work for Louis Vuitton, Christian Dior, Fendi, Bulgari, etc. So he's uh, built eight stores in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive, numerous storms in, stores in New York and Hawaii, Brazil, and Mexico. So this guy has, um, he's been around, he knows the craft very well. Um, ultimately, he started Iconic Cabinets back in 2012. And since then, they've, he's really established himself and his company as an industry leader. Um, they're one of the only true local cabinet shops that actually builds their product in-house here in Edmonton. So it is truly locally made. It's built by cabinet, uh, journeyman cabinet makers. This is a, uh, an expertly produced project product. So anyhow, um, enough of my rambling. So Jerry Dixon, I will bring him into the show here. Uh, we've done lots of projects with, with Jerry over the last several years. Uh, fantastic work with them. They do a great job. And there's certain things about getting an iconic kitchen that it truly sets it apart from, from the other options that are out there. But there's lots of good cabinet makers. So today isn't about selling you anything. Today is about hoping to educate you about kitchen, kitchen design, and things to consider um, for your project. So we'll wait for Jerry to, to get pulled into the show here. Let's wait for them to come on board here. So, you know, a kitchen, the kitchen is considered that jewel of your home, right? So when you're doing your renovation, you consider renovating your home, that's somewhere you need to put a lot of thought and, uh, you know, and really prepare and plan for your layout, the design, and, and some of the features that you want within your kitchen. There are so many interesting, cool new features that are available that um, many people aren't, aren't aware of, and some of them aren't expensive, and, and some are. just depends where you want to put your money. Um, and I think it's important to give some thought to us out there and at that point, you can make sure your kitchen turns out to be uh, as great as you hoped. So having an issue here. Iconic cabinets. Add them in there. All right. Hopefully, he'll come on board here soon. So anyhow, so it's a matter of considering what you're going to want and how you're going to use your space. And here's Jerry. So Jerry. Hello. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Round two. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. All right. Good to have you back. So we're back on site uh, in one of Jerry's kitchens that he built. And it's a great kitchen to showcase some of the options that are available and things to consider um, when you're planning your kitchen renovation, right? So absolutely. I guess we could probably start with just generally, you know, topics like layout and things to consider and different styles of kitchens that are out there. And why don't we start by looking at the kitchen you have there? And we can talk a bit about, um, you know, some of the features within and things to consider when designing your kitchen. And, and this, I guess you'd consider this a galley kitchen. Well, I guess kind of a semi-galley. Yeah, semi-galley. Yeah. 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 So the the big thing with this one is, like, what do you want the kitchen for? Like, obviously, you want to use it for cooking, right? That's obvious. But a lot of people want to use it for entertaining. Uh, some people want to use it to actually eat at. Uh, some people don't want to see it. So you, you need walls to close it off. So what is it that people want to use the kitchen for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and how do they use it, right? Are they, do they, 
is is the act of cooking part of what they do when they host? Like some people love to cook and want that to be kind of the focal point of the the night. It's almost like entertainment. And others don't really want you to see what happens in the kitchen. They're more focused on, you know, entertaining at the table in a separate room, right? Yeah, exactly. So this one is, is made for the open style. So everybody's going to hover around the island. You know, some people will sit, some will just stand. Uh, you put the hors d'oeuvres on the counter, that type of idea. Mm -hmm. so each, pers each person has something different. Like I know a lot of people that just don't want to see the kitchen. They want to hide the kitchen. They want to hide the mess, that type of idea. This one's not for that. This is all for a show. Right. And I think yeah. part of that too, when you're planning, you know, your kitchen, where is your range, your cooktop going to go, right? Because some people like having, like, for example, in this case, in the island, you could have your range in the island with a big fancy range hood. And as you cook, um, you know, you, that would be part of the entertainment, right? Others prefer not to, they just would serve on that surface. This one's got the sink, um, you know, which again is a practical place to put it. Uh, it's and, and I guess that's part of how they came up with that design. Yeah. I like the little uh, butler's kitchen back there. Yeah, this is actually made for baking. If you notice, the countertop is two different heights. Right? So yeah. it's lower if you actually do baking. So you can actually roll the bread out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would certainly help your someone's back, right? I mean, if you're trying to get leverage on something, whatever your workstation's at, if the countertop's too high, it can be a bit more, a bit, bit of a challenge for sure. Absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. So this, a, this kitchen here has a lot of the uh, more modern appliances, like the gas stove, the gas grill, uh, the microwave that's actually in the island, where most people would put the microwave up with the oven and stove, or the ovens. Mm -hmm. But because she likes to bake two ovens, uh, the microwave is, it's kind of a different type, right? It actually is a drawer style. Yeah. Which is, to me, is kind of weird. You're actually putting stuff inside the, uh, inside the, uh, inside of it. Mm hmm Yeah, interesting. And there's so many options out there. It's interesting. I mean, one thing about microwaves, for sure, a lot of people are used to that more traditional placement of up on the upper cabinet. And the challenge with that is if you have heavier items, you have to kind of raise them up quite high. And that again can be difficult, especially for people, either for younger kids or older folks. So it's nice to get it down to that countertop height. And the island can be a nice spot for it too, but it's a matter of considering now you have to bend over to put stuff in or take it out. So really it's based on, you know, client preference as far as how they, how often they use it. Some people hardly ever use their microwave and some use it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, so like I said, and a lot of people actually have two kitchens. So this would be a kitchen for show, and then you'd have another kitchen for actually cooking. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I don't know if a lot of people do, but some people some have people do. kitchens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's very popular for the, uh, like, Asian, Asian cooking, like the yeah. spice kitchens, they call them. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So then it's so, kind of a... I like how they've incorporated the kind of the library at the end of the island there. And again, it's a matter of how you plan to use the space, right? Yeah. She has a lot of cookbooks, so. <laughs> yeah. And it's a nice, nice little, little dis makes for a nice little display at the same time. Yeah. The other thing that this kitchen has, uh, like I said, the, it has the, for the baking, but the pantry itself is actually set up for the appliances. So you don't have the appliances on your counter. So like the toaster and all that stuff, you don't have to have it out in the open where everybody sees. Right. You can pop it into the, the back of the room. Yeah. yeah, that's a good, nice little look. I see often too, like appliance garages, we'll see those go into our kitchen sometimes. And it's a nice way to tuck it away so it's out of, out of sight. You don't have a, so much cluster or clutter on your countertops. Yeah, exactly. You don't yeah. need to have all the clutter, not all the time anyways. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. that specific island, like that's, that's a large island, right? So it's yep. got a, a large countertop. So we should probably talk about that for a second. So if you're, you're planning your island and the size of your island will obviously dictate then your countertop size and depending on what kind of overhang you want. So this one's got, you know, a countertop height overhang. So you can put some stools there and use yep. it as an eating surface. Others we see they want, um, you know, a raised bar to have a taller eating surface on a full, you know, on a kind of a bar stool. Yeah. Um, 
which in this case, so because it's one large slab, you either need to have, a, you know, it's possible to buy a slab that size or be prepared to have a seam in the slab. Yeah, this one's 15 feet, so you can't get a 15 foot. So you do have right. to have a, a joint. Yeah. That's a close up of it. But if you actually look back, it's very difficult to see the joint. Yeah, a good countertop installer makes it really hard to see the seam. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, one thing to consider too, and we had this problem in a penthouse uh, reno we did together last year, is that um, they had a very large island and we could get a slab large enough to do a seamless install on the island, but we couldn't get the slab up to the penthouse because it wouldn't fit in the elevator. Um, and there was no way to get it into the building without getting a crane and then craning it up to the, the 24th floor was um, just too cost prohibitive. So we had to cut the slab down and uh, we ended up with a seam, but you know, like I said, you know, a good, a good countertop installer makes that uh, almost invisible. Yeah. And that's a, is that a quartz or a granite in there? That's a granite on this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They so, wanted to go control. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So one thing to consider too, like a, primarily we put mostly quartz in our projects nowadays. It seems to be kind of the go-to for most people. But, you know, I mean, they, the difference between a quartz and a granite is on one hand subtle, on the other hand, very different. Whereas the granite is a natural product. No two pieces are the same. The quartz is a man-made product. So, you know, you can get uh, more consistency within your slab and your look, right? So... And the granite is a, you know, there's a bit more need for maintenance on a granite top than you get on a quartz top as well. But those are things to consider as well when, you know, planning your kitchen. The other thing is you don't have to use, like this, this is supposed to be the feature, the island. So on the other stuff, you don't have to have the same. You can go quartz on the yeah. outside. So the outsides are quartz and the inside is the only one that's granite. Yeah, very true. And, and in your kitchen design, it's what they consider as well is, you know, whether it's your countertops or your backsplash tile or your cabinets themselves, which do you want to be the focal point? Do you want to draw attention to that surface? And in this case, yeah, the island, it's a massive island. And yeah, it becomes a focal point and a meeting place and, and uh, absolutely make that stand out and, and make it notable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful kitchen. Certainly the range hood is a, is a unique style of range hood there. You want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, like it, it always looks good to have the range hood so big. And a lot of people love to have it. Like this one here is about uh, five feet, five foot range hood. Wow. Right? And it, the, the thing with the range hood is if you have such a big range hood, like my ceiling, like my head height, and I'm mm -hmm. six feet, so it's six and a half feet high, <clears throat> you have to add in an air makeup system in order to have something that's this big. Like this is more yeah. like a restaurant style. Absolutely. And we see that like basically most people want the big fancy range hoods now and don't understand that, you know, if you have a range hood that's above 350 CFM, you're likely going to need to add a makeup air unit or interlock it to your furnace. Because what happens with these large range hoods is they'll draw so much air out of the home, they can actually start pulling exhaust air into your living areas. So that might be from your mechanical room or basement or, or in general, you might see yourself being kind of starved for fresh air in the house. So you need to make sure you consider that. You might want that big range hood, but what are some of the logistical considerations that you need to take into, you know, into account when planning for that? Because nothing's worse than finding that out after you come for your final inspection and then it fails because you don't have the venting done properly, right? Or the makeup air system in place. Well, other than that, than the price, you realize it's beautiful, but then all of a sudden you get an extra cost right. for an aircraft system. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And that, you know, that could add anywhere from a few hundred dollars for a furnace um, interconnect, or it could be, you know, a couple thousand dollars for a makeup air unit, depending on how much ducting you have to run. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess let's talk a little bit about the door style and, and the, the construction materials of this kitchen. Yeah, so this one here is actually... Uh, real real wood right <clears throat> excuse me and you can see the grains they're all matched up mm -hmm. which is kind of nice like a lot of people don't do this anymore where they actually match the grains yeah i mean that that's an attention to detail obviously yeah. that um you know it's there's a cost that comes with that and just again it's planning right yeah but to me it's it's well worth it like if 
like you spend a little bit more, but if you ended up with a whole kitchen with lined up wood, like maybe it's because mm -hmm. I'm a cabinet maker, I appreciate seeing that. But Absolutely. if you don't notice the difference, then don't pay extra for it. But, but yeah. I notice the difference and I think it's well worth it. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just one of those things where when you do notice it, it's like, wow, that that's beautiful, you know, and you can tell it's a, you know, it's, it's craftsmanship, right? Yeah, absolutely. This one here, they wanted a modern style. So modern is usually a flat door. Uh, yeah. Rift cut is always normal. Everybody seems to like rift cut uh, okay. for modern. Yeah. And a lot so of people are actually going like, for the oak. What's the cut there? Sorry, can you explain that? The cup? Mm, okay. What do you mean the cup? Yeah, we well, said the grip grit cuts is that what you said rift cut so uh, there's when, when you cut the the veneer like when you cut a log there's yeah. basically two types of cuts basically okay. there's a there's a flat cut where you see the heart of the wood yeah and then a rift cut where it's all straight grain so when you do modern it's more straight grain if you do yeah. more uh classic it's more rift cut gotcha okay yeah. so that what kind of wood is that this one here is walnut it's a walnut yeah. Okay. It's walnut, but it has a stain on it. So it's kind of a, it's, it's more of a man-made stain type idea. So it, it, it's not a natural wood. Got you. So let's talk a bit about door types and, and materials for a second. So I, I out there in the marketplace, there's a variety of different products out there that will contribute to your, you know, obviously the price and look of your kitchen. So in this case, we have a walnut door and it's a stain grade you can get into paint grade finishes where you might see uh, an MDF door that's painted. And, um, and also, you know, there's thermofoil products out there that are available. There's melamine products. Um, let's talk a little bit about the options there and what some of the pros and cons are. And, and I guess what would be considered most popular now? Well, it basically all comes down to price. Like a lot of people would like to have uh, like a real nice walnut, but when it comes down to it, it's really expensive. And it's a big difference in a kitchen, right, for a price. Uh, the cheapest you can go is called textured melamine, right? So it's just a melamine finish. Then it's a foil, which is the next step up. And then you have uh, some of the high gloss uh, melamine. So you'll see a lot of high gloss kitchens out there right now. Mm -hmm. That'd be next. Then you go to a flat panel wood, like a maple wood usually a stain and a lacquer. And then you go to a raised panel, which is more money. And yeah. then paint finish is actually more expensive than uh, stain finish. Oh, paint really? is more expensive than stain. Yep. No, oh, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, most people aren't. Yeah, so I think one thing like to consider, like the, an MDF, a painted MDF door is very popular now. And, you know, there's, there's a, there, I guess there's two sides of the story there where some people want that salt, that wood door, the real solid wood door, which is made up of multiple pieces, right? To give you that, the door construction. Whereas an MDF door is a single piece of wood. They route out the pattern and then it's generally painted, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in our climates, I mean, I guess uh, what I've heard before is that you might see some cracking sometimes in your joints in a wood door because of the amount of the seasonal changes in climate whereas in a, a single piece construction like an mdf door that wouldn't occur because there's no joints to crack yeah that's true now a lot of people have the illusion that solid wood is the best you got to have real wood real solid wood real veneer so they want veneer interiors or plywood interiors they want solid wood doors on the outside. They want solid gables on the outside. But as a cabinet maker, and for my own house, I wouldn't do that. I would more realize, I would be more happy to go with a like a MDF or something, a veneer panel, something mm -hmm. that will last. And the insides, I would go with melamine. It's so easy to clean. Right. They last a long time. Granted, if you get uh, a mount, like a good amount of water, it'll wreck it. But mm -hmm. a good amount of water on any wood will wreck it too. Yeah, very true. Let's talk a little bit about door hardware, and that would be a good time to segue into our giveaway this week. <laughs> so Jerry's offered up uh, through Marathon Hardware uh, new free new cabinet handles for your kitchen. Yeah. Um, and to be qualified for the draw, you see the comment in here where Iconic manufactures their cabinets. In which city are they manufactured? And I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Super local. <laughs> <laughs> 
anyhow, so enter that in the comments. If you entered for the draw at the end of the show, we'll uh, we'll announce who gets the um, the the new the new cabinet handles. Yeah. That'd so what do we have for handles on in this kitchen here? Well, we have two, two types of handles. We have two yeah. types of handles in this kitchen. We got finger poles, which are these ones here that go on top of the door. Yeah. And then we got knobs. Okay. Right. So it gives a, a look like this. Now, the nice part about that is if you actually have a, like a door that you have hidden, like this one, yeah. the finger knobs go at the top, so you don't really see them. Oh, yeah. Quite right? hidden. So it's hidden underneath. Mm -hmm. So when you close it, you don't see the handle at all, unless you're laying on the floor. So it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a nice handle to have for that kind of thing. Absolutely. And this whole kitchen will be done the same way. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and I mean, we see it quite often with people who want to kind of modernize the look of their existing kitchens and don't want to do a big reno or replace them. Changing your hardware can go a long way. Uh, it can make a big difference in the look of your kitchen, especially with some of the more dated cabinet handle profiles that are out there. So um, would, are most of them like set, the, the whole offsets are the same generally, or is that something someone needs to really consider when looking for new handles? You have to consider that all the time because okay. the, the it's nice to say a three inch or a four inch offset, but every everyone's different. Most of the handles are different. Gotcha. Okay. Well, make sure that uh, you give that some thought before you go and order your new handles. <laughs> I know we see it sometimes too with the length of the screw, right? You'll you'll order your new handles and the screw's not long enough, or it's too long, so you have to go and and either trim it's them all back different. or it's quite a nuisance, or find new screws, right? So. Um, drawer type, what do we have in there? Um, yeah, that's one thing where people can obviously choose to put money as well, whether they want a dovetailed drawer, they want a metal drawer, and there's various grades of quality, obviously. Can we talk a bit about that? Yeah. The drawers themselves, I always use melamine for most of my drawers. And melamine drawers are actually really good. We use 5 eighths. It's heavy duty. We use the soft close, uh, undermount. Uh, they're excellent drawers. And I've never had a drawer fall apart knock on wood. <laughs> now, when you get into the other ones, like metal and dovetail and that kind of thing, you're looking more for uh, uh, for people who see it. Like if you open up a drawer and they see dovetail, your company or your guests, they know that's a good drawer. Like that's, that's quality, right? Uh, this house here has a new style of drawer, uh, the Moventos. It's uh, from uh, Bloom. And the okay. drawers themselves, I just want to pick a drawer that's not too. <laughs> so the drawers themselves are actually metal slides, right? And I'm going to tip this underneath so you can maybe see underneath. Oh, yeah. And the slides are all, it's a, it's a new product that they brought out, and I wanted to try it, and I wanted to use it, be the first to use it. And they're an excellent drawer. The back here is actually melamine still. Okay. These are metal, and I matched the melamine black to it, so it all looks like a solid metal drawer. Okay, but that's got an incorporated soft close, obviously. And yeah, everybody, everything yeah. we do is soft close. Like you don't yeah. buy a car without power windows, so I figure you shouldn't get right. a cabinet without soft close on everything. Yeah, I had a client call me yesterday about a kitchen reno, and she was asking if it would come with soft close, and I was, I think it might be harder to get it without soft close now. I think oh. it's such a go-to <laughs> feature that. It would be just considered standard at this point. Yeah, exactly. It should be. If you go to a place and they ask you, is it add-on? You know, it's, it's the same thing if you went and bought a car and they said, well, if you wanted the window or the power windows, that's an extra. Right. So it just doesn't seem right anymore. I agree. Let's talk a bit about pullouts. And I know that this kitchen doesn't have much for a pullout feature, but I'm trying to find a good picture that depicts it. So... So it's one way to really maximize your storage in your kitchen is to add some pullouts because sometimes a cupboard doesn't store things and give you access the way a pullout would. So here's an example of pullouts. You can kind of see it behind me here, I guess, but it looks like a regular cabinet door at first, but then it pulls out and you have access from both sides uh, to full depth, right? So it's a great way to add more storage space in your home and there's different options, right? We can go with the wood construction. They look really slick. You can get into the, the metal, um, do you have any comments on, on the pullout features? Oh, yeah. This, to me, this is excellent because a lot of people have a cupboard and they fill it full of stuff and they have no clue what they have in there anymore. So they go buy new stuff. They end up with 37 cans of beans because they didn't realize they had <laughs> beans in their can cupboard. 
So being able to pull it out, you can see what you have all the time. It's actually uh, an excellent way to utilize your storage. And then you don't have to store so much anymore, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and like you said, it goes through rotation more quickly. You can see that it's all there. I mean, clearly there's a cost that comes with a feature like this. But these are the kind of things that really can make or break your kitchen, especially if you are limited on space and can't keep adding more and more cabinets. Here, I think, is a way you can spend a bit more money on your on your pullout options, and you can use it for different ways. Here's an example. We're using it for dishes. Um, yeah. you know, some other ones, It's a, in this case, it's a spice rack pullout. Here, um, you know, it's more of just like your canned goods. So, and you can lay these out so you can put, you fit in there cereal boxes, larger boxes, and down to like very small uh, separations, depending on what you want to store in there. Um, what about things like, oh, this picture's not going to work, but I wonder if these will work. I'm trying to show you an appliance lift. Um, do you have any appliance lifts in my kitchen or anything of that nature? No, I don't have any appliance lifts because she puts the mixer right on top of her counter, right? It's, okay. it, her counter is made for ba baking, so why not have the mixer on there all the time? But okay. yeah, the mixer lifts work perfectly. They pull up and lock because you think these things move a lot. And if you're making bread and stuff, it's, there's a lot of bumping and banging around. So the lifts are really good. And it's an excellent thing for somebody who has a hard time lifting the, the lift. Mm -hmm. Definitely get one. Yeah. Absolutely. We've done one together in a house last year where they had a, a big mixer. You can't see the mixer well in this image. I don't know if I have a better picture I can show you. But anyways, I mean, the mixer itself weighed uh, quite a bit and it was an older couple. So this specific product here, basically the mixer stays on one surface at all times. And then it just, you know, has a hydraulic lift system where it then retracts into the cabinets and the door closes and there it is you never actually lift it you just basically you know push a release button or, or push it back down into place so it's super, super convenient yeah um and there's like the Le Mans corner unit so that's the my corner <laughs> the corner cabinets so these yeah. pictures are cropped a bit too tight but so the inside corner cabinet is a notorious place i have two of them in my kitchen and they're like a black hole yeah I just again, keep putting more and again, more stuff goes into it and you can hardly ever find it again. Yeah, and you end up buying the same thing over again because you don't know what you have. Yeah. The, the Le Mans is one of the best ones I found. It takes up most of the cabinet and it's so easy to use and it's really impressive when you see it working. Absolutely. So these things basically, it's hard to tell from this photo, but they it's two separate, um, I guess, trays you'd call them and they they fully pull right out of the corner. So you have full access to everything that's on the shelf or the tray in there. And uh, it's, it's a fantastic unit. I mean, clearly it costs more than a Lazy Susan. But at the same time, this is another one of those features that I believe are worth every penny because now you have access to everything. It's easy to keep it organized. Um, really, really a great, a great feature. Yeah, it's one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. What else can we talk about here? Um, mm, 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 mm. We'll pull out some pictures of some kitchens here. Bear with me while I scroll across to find them. Well, this is from that same house now we're in. Oh, some of the cropping doesn't work out so well here when I pull them into Instagram, but bear with me here. I'm trying to find some of our kitchens that we've done together. There's been um, a few. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So this is not one of ours, but let's talk a bit about uh, glass doors and yeah. the uses of them right so um in my perspective it's a way to be able to see where stuff is if you don't have a great memory perhaps but i think also it's a way to display your items and it's also a way that you can have some pretty cool little light features and create you know a nice look within your kitchen so um do you have any thoughts on the glass in general and how you use it yeah it, it all depends on the person again like if you have something nice to uh, put in there then do clear glass. But if you don't have anything really that you wanted to show off, you can always put obscured glass in there. You could just, you know, so it's subtle. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to light them all up. Uh, if you if you have something again, like your grandmother's china, then light it up. Like show it off. That's what it's there for. That's the whole point of the glass. Yeah, I agree. And often, like we'll do it, you know, to kind of like like I said, with the lighting feature, right? So you could obscure the glass, and then you still backlight it, and it creates a really nice little glow in the kitchen. And it serves well as a night light, or it serves well as just kind of an interesting little design feature. So I think incorporating glass and accenting it with lighting can be, be a really cool way to make your kitchen, um, you know, stand out and, and be unique. Yeah, absolutely. 
I like glass personally, but I don't like being able to see what's in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Um, this is that kitchen from that penthouse we did there last year. Um, and this is the one that incorporates, I don't think I have a picture that'll show all the pullouts, but it's got these fantastic wood pullout units. And again, it's great for storage. And you can put these in on either side of your stove and just do the spice rack idea again, like we discussed already. But uh, it's, a, it's something that, you know, uh, really can add some more storage capacity to your kitchen. Bear with me here. I'm just trying to pull up these pictures, but they aren't where I thought they were. So I guess as far as like your some when you're planning your kitchen reno and you're you're considering a layout for your kitchen and where you're going to put your appliances, I think it's something like um, you know with the for example the island. Like if we look at the the island that we have now, uh, the kitchen you're in, you've got your sink in the island there. So if you currently have a kitchen, you're planning a reno and you want to move your sink into the island, you need to consider some of the plumbing. How do you get your drain line there and your water lines over there? And how are we gonna vent that island? So, you know, just things to consider. If you wanna put your stove into your island, then if it's gas, we need to get the gas plumb to it. You will need to add a vent then above your island. So, uh, or a rain should. Again, there's things to consider when it comes um, time to plan your kitchen layout. And that's something that, you know, definitely talk to your you know, you're a, a good cabinet maker will understand some of these considerations and we'll talk through them with you. If you're not too sure, then talk to your general contractor and certainly we can help out with those uh, planning details because you might think you want this stuff in your island and it might result in a need for a bulkhead and a ceiling downstairs underneath your kitchen, which might not work for you. Um, or it might add a fair bit of money to the cost of, of your project. So it's stuff that you need to think about well, well in advance. Yeah. Um, in this particular kitchen here, this island I'm showing, it's got that raised bar. And again, that's something that, you know, usually I would say it's kind of love hate for people. Some people really love having the raised bar. It creates a backsplash for the island that kind of separates the workspace from the serving area. But then you do lose that consistently, that consistent surface. So it kind of limits a little bit of the work area. And really it's based on personal preference. Yeah, but also a lot of people look at it and think it's old school. Like that's the way yeah. it used to be. Yeah. Now it's supposed to be flat. But it's all about person. It doesn't matter about what we like. It's what the client likes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, and I would say like in this example here, you see those little brackets there, that the little knee bangers. Yeah. So that's something that we just, we typically don't do those unless someone likes them as far as like the aesthetic, somebody might like it. And every now and then we get someone who likes that kind of classic look. But you know, you go hop up into that stool. Now you're going to bonk your knee on that bracket. It can be um, quite, quite annoying. So we have kind of a flat bracket system that we use now. So you can't see it, but it still provides that support for the top. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a of, like a lot of this stuff here in my mind, um, like it's good to get a designer involved mainly because of the, the design of it. Um, once it comes, it gets an idea of what you're looking for, like the basics, the flat counter and stuff like that. It's good to get a cabinet maker involved so that he understands what you're actually wanting if it's buildable. Mm -hmm. And then the contractor, he needs to get involved because there's cost to everything. Like people sometimes don't realize it, but popping a plug in on the side or, a, you know, whatever you want, putting a mixer lift with the power inside the cabinet or something like that, there's there's a cost there. Somebody mm -hmm. has to pay for it, right? And you don't think of yeah. That's the full point of contractor, just so you can add up the numbers, so you don't get sidetracked or right. caught off guard. Yeah, and just have the right order of operations in place. You know, nothing's more frustrating than you get something done and installed. You realize after the fact, oh shoot, you need an electrical receptacle there. Well, backsplash is already done. It won't pass <laughs> final inspection now because you don't have a plug-in where you need it. Well, the only way to get that plug-in in there now is to take your backsplash off your tile that you just installed. So, I mean, the general contractor is certainly worth considering a conversation with. I think any good contractor will give you some advice and I would hope they'd coach you. If you can't find someone to do that, then you can call me. I'm happy to consult for you and steer you in the right direction. Um, you know, Jerry touched on your kitchen design. Yeah, I mean, you should get involved with the designer early on. But one thing we've run into before is I think that making sure your designer and your contractor are in communication together because we've often come back with these client brings forward this amazing kitchen design, um, but then turns out the actual construction cost, not just of the cabinetry, but 
of all the logistical and framework needed to make that kitchen um, pass inspections, sometimes the cost gets runs too high. So someone had a budget of like our average kitchens that we do, like I'm talking a kitchen renovation. So new cabinets, countertops, backsplash tile, new flooring, all your wiring, your lighting, all that stuff. Our average kitchens that we do run between, you know, I say 60 to $70,000 all in. And then we do a bunch a year that are maybe, you know, in that 30 to 50 range. Those are generally an Ikea kitchen or we do the $100,000 plus kitchens, which is usually where we're doing something that's either a very large kitchen or it's a very high end finish or, you know, lots of design um, features, something like the house that you're in now. Right. Yeah. But there's nothing worse than someone coming up and their, their budget is a hard 40 K and they come back to us with a design that's, it's a $65,000 design. Right. And that's where I think it's important that the contractor and the designer communicate well, right. And keep the cabinet maker in the loop because some of the little features you're asking for, you know, for example, those pull out storage units, those things add like it's an easy thousand bucks a pop to add one of those in. Yeah. The mods thousand thousands easy. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. we got a question here. I'm just going to see if I can track her down. Hmm, let's see here. I don't know, Schleedai, I don't know how to pronounce her tag. She has a question for Jerry. Uh, I don't see the question, though. Where is it? She's typing. She's typing. There you go. You know who that is? But, no, but a lot of times the uh, the kitchen itself or, or the contracting work, like for you, if people give us a budget, we can usually give you something. But yeah. it, sometimes it's not exactly what you dreamt about, but it's... It's, we can give you, like, I can give you a kitchen for anything, almost any price. Yeah. It just, it might not be what you're thinking. That's all. Absolutely. So it's nice to have that budget. Yeah. Yeah. I got um, Soul Restoration. That's our friend Tamara. She's commenting that she wants a waterfall edge on her, on her countertop. And I'm going to pull up a picture here that shows one in a second here. And a waterfall edge works well on some applications and not so well in others. This picture, it's hard to see it, but the waterfall edge is where your countertop wraps around and serves almost as a leg going back down to the floor. And the nice thing about a waterfall edge is you can then, like Jerry did with the grain matching on the cabinets, you can do that with your, pro, your pattern on your countertop and it creates a, a really, really pretty little transition and, and a, almost like a, a framework to showcase the, the island itself in this case. A lot of people are doing the waterfall edge. It's it's very popular right now. Yeah. Same thing with same thing with that blue. The blue is very popular, the, the till blue. Yeah, yeah, very true. We have a black kitchen in the works right now, which would be interesting. So Schlidai says, I bought a house recently and the cabinet doors are peeling a bit from the bottom. Do they need to be replaced or can they be refinished? This is Ashley from Acclaimed. Well, the chances if it's peeling from the bottom, uh, there's water. There's some kind of water issue that comes mm -hmm. along with that, like if, how they cleaned it or something. Uh, so it actually has to be sanded off and redone. And it depends how bad it is. If it's not that bad, you could probably get away with, uh, I'm just trying to think if there was a picture of it. If, yeah. if, if it's just painted, right? Like that looks like it's... Uh, this isn't hers. I just picked up a picture oh, okay. of that. This is, I, think, I was going to say, that's a foil door. Yeah, that's a <laughs> thermal foil that's peeling. That was <laughs> Can't do anything with that. <laughs> yeah. That one you'd have to replace. But uh, if, it, right. if it's not foil and it's painted, you should be able to sand it and, and touch it up. Mm -hmm. if, if it's foil, there's nothing you can do. You just have to replace it. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the whole um, option to, to reface a kitchen. So before we do that, let's talk about a giveaway because I just want to give away your handles. And, and uh, so anyway, Jerry has brought um, uh, his giveaway item is free replacement cabinet handles for your kitchen. Um, so if you could enter in the comments where Iconic builds their cabinets and which city they're made, then that'll enter you into the draw. And at the end of the show, we'll give away the, the new cabinet handles, right? Yep. And those are graciously donated um those are from marathon hardware correct yeah donated by us but from marathon oh there you go. okay yeah well, good and they're okay. they're one of the better handles so yeah great um okay so we were going to talk about the option to reface 
So we get phone calls every now and then from clients and they like their configuration, but their kitchen's dated and they want to reface and think they can just put new doors on. And sometimes that's the case, depending on the, whether you're changing colors or not. So if you're, if you're doing a drastic color change, so that you have a dark or a natural oak, which is really common, or a peach, a whitewashed peach oak cabinet, and you want to go to white or a very contrasting color, you need to consider about the, the edge trim on your cabinets as well and on the sides of the, the finished panels there. So let's talk a bit about that, Jerry, and, and give people a heads up as to when it's doable and when it's just kind of cost prohibitive to even bother refacing. In my opinion, if you're going to reface, like uh, refacing basically means re redoing the doors, like take the doors off, put new doors on. But you also have to worry about the fillers. So if you take something like this, you have a filler, this filler here has to get replaced. This side panel has to get replaced. Yeah. And the doors have to get replaced. Now with the doors, I don't replace the doors unless they're bloom hinges. So if your hinge says bloom, I'll replace the doors. But if they say something like Salici or some other brand, a lot of time it's too cheap and it just becomes too much of a hassle to replace the doors. Mainly because if the cabinet maker is cutting corners on the hardware like the bloom, then they're probably cutting corners elsewhere and it just, you end up with different issues later on. Yeah, absolutely. Color, and I would say you wouldn't have to worry about it, but the whole idea of replacing the doors is to get a different color. So when you replace right. the doors, you now have to replace the edging, the light valences, you have to replace all kinds of things. Like what would you do with the hood? Well, you have to replace a whole new hood, Yeah. right? And by the time you're done, you're, you're, you're at about 75% of the kitchen. Absolutely. So another 20, for another 25%, you just get a whole new kitchen. That's right. And then at that point, you have the option to reconfigure or add some features you don't currently have. When you reface, you're not upgrading your hardware at all. So if you have, you know, old aluminum drawer slides that are bent and the plastic wheels are broken and all that kind of stuff, like that's your chance to upgrade those at the same time. So, you know, when you're considering... Um, you know, refacing, you need to understand that you really, it's purely aesthetic. You're not improving the function. You're not improving the layout or the design. You're just basically changing the color, maybe the door profile, right? Yeah. If you're going to go that route, my advice would be almost to just paint them and replace your handle. So it costs you less money. It's a short term solution, but I think refacing, and don't get me wrong, sometimes refacing makes sense. I'm not 100% against it, but generally, um, I don't generally recommend it, right? Yeah, I don't recommend it either. For me, if, if you're going to change your kitchen and you're going to spend that money, spend a little bit more and get something different and something that you can be proud of. Yeah, absolutely. Here I have Make It Legendary. This is a friend of mine, Sean. Um, he's commented McIntyre Industrial. Is that where your shop is located? No. Oh, you get very <laughs> specific. I just need a city. <laughs> Uh, enter the city in which Iconic Cabinets builds their cabinets, manufactures them, and you're entered into yeah. the draw. Yeah, you give you a hint, your butt is placed in that city now. So there you go. How's that for a hint? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Kevin Cordy's asking. I, I <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kevin Cordy's asking, Jerry, are there any smart home add-ons for a kitchen? And we talked about a few of them, but is there anything we haven't talked about that would be worth addressing? Um. That's a good question. Like there's a lot of things that you can get for like your taps. Uh, this one doesn't have it, but a lot of the taps, you can actually have the tap where you touch it and the water turns on and off. <laughs> yeah. So that way when you have dirty hands, you can do that. I think they're called touchless in theory. Touch. Yeah. Oh, touchless. Touch. Sorry, touch. Yeah. <laughs> but you still have to touch it. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of stuff in there. Like you can, like a lot of the stuff is plumbing. Like Kevin could probably answer more of these questions than me. Right. Like, uh, you know, sensors that turn off the water in case there's a leak. Um, just a lot of things like your timers, but right. automation for a kitchen, there's not as much as you'd think. Right. Like a fr you could buy the fridge, the Samsung fridge that actually shows you what's inside. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Oh, there you are. One, one really cool feature, I think, for someone who's vertically challenged like me, is I've seen them where they have the built in step stool, and it's a very thin little kind of pull out unit that then uh, opens up into a little step stool. Uh, so if you know you have some, you know, 
ceiling height storage and you have some stuff stored up there, you can have this little pop down step stool. It's really handy. That's a really cool feature. Um, we've done some really interesting little pop up things for receptacles too, where you can have then power pop up out of a countertop where you're not always looking at it. Um, those things have some code limitations in some areas, so it's worth looking into that first with your electrician. But um, yeah, we talked a bit about when I was doing the electrical show with um, with Neil King from Apex there a couple of weeks ago about the backsplash and the option to put the receptacles in the underside of the upper cabinets as opposed to having them right in the backsplash and really disturbing the look, right? So um, standard, you'd see like you see there in, in the picture you're showing, there's your backsplash plug right there. Um, and we did a kitchen together last year where we actually built the cabinet in a way that you could have the receptacle mounted on the other side of the cabinet, on the underside, sorry. And uh, it, was, it left us with a really clean finish for the backsplash. It was a handmade tile that we brought in from Australia and we didn't want to have it, um, you know, all cut up around the receptacles. Yeah. I'm trying to find the picture of that, but I don't know if I kept it on my, <clears throat> my phone, pardon me. Um, Angie Hutchison's asking, um, she never asked, but what's the weight capacity for uh, a pantry drawer? I think that'll probably depend on the manufacturer, but what are your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the drawers are actually with the the undermount slides. They can actually hold quite a bit of weight. So they're around 40 kilograms. Well, wow. right. So that's, you think that's a whole lot of weight. <laughs> so yeah, 40 actually, kilograms is a good number to go by. If you get the cheaper ones, they're 20. But the ones we use are usually 40. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. I can almost stand on that thing. Yep. It's a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I was trying to scroll to find this picture of this backsplash, but don't have it handy. Okay, Let's see here. Um, appliances and how we configure them within your island. So in that penthouse we did last year, within that island we had a, uh, a wine fridge and we had also a double drawered freezer, right? So. I think, again, if you're planning a kitchen reno and you're a bit stuck on where on a configuration or a layout, um, you know, certainly talk to your designer, a, your good, good general contractor and a cabinet maker, because we can help with those layouts and find a way to um, pack, you know, pack a bunch of features into the cabinetry. I got Jerry's uh, comment in it. His phone is running out. So <laughs> if we lose Jerry, it'll be a, that'll be a, a goodbye, but we'll, we'll keep him on until that happens. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so, I mean, you can, within your configuration, there's lots of different ways you can use it. You know, um, I think that how you lay out your appliances is very important. We have what's called that golden triangle where you want to, you know, keep your, your fridge and your stove and your sink close together so that it's all kind of easy to access um, one from the other. One thing we should discuss too is like the amount of space you have between your island and the countertop across from it. Yeah, so for me, it's 40 inches. Like yeah. 40 inches is the best. Uh, if you go 48, you have to actually step. If you go 36, then two people like me can't pass. Right. Right. So 40 is usually the best number to use. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if, it, if it's wider than 48, yeah, I mean, it becomes something where you now, instead of just pivoting on the spot and being able to step to your island, now it's a matter of you have to walk there. It's a very first world problem. I know that. Um, but, you know, it's all about planning your kitchen in a way that it's easy to use and, uh, and it makes good sense for you, right? Some people want to have a more open and spacious area and that's fine, but you need to understand what that means in a practical sense too, right? So it's all about balancing that fashion and that function. So, um, door profiles, what would you say, like this one in the house you're in now, it's a very modern flat finish. You know, we flat see a lot, of shaker, a lot of shaker door profiles going in. These are a bit more yeah. kind of classic, these ones in the background there. Um, what would you say, here's, here's kind of a shaker idea, which is just kind of a raised flat panel on the outside. What's more, most popular for you now? Well, there's, there's three styles which people like. So it's either gonna be modern, Transitional or classic? Transitional is a bit of both. What you're showing there is more of a transitional. So what they try to do is put a shaker door with a flat riser. So no crown, just a nice yeah. straight riser. And that's the most popular. 
transitional. Alberta yeah. has a lot of classic people, but all the young, uh, younger ones want shiny and new, so they want simple, classy. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of coming back again, the flat panel. I'm trying to see if I got a good shot. I can show you some doors here, but they're all, they're cropping in a bit too tight. Okay. Let's talk about thermofoil for a second. I got this. I brought this one picture up because thermofoil used to have this reputation to be just a horrible product that would eventually peel or it would, you know, steam would damage it. I know it's come a long way. You want to talk a bit about thermofoil? Well, thermofoil I never touched before because they were bad. Right. But now they've, they've actually come up with a better system, a better glue. Um, they last quite long. So I use them a lot in condos or uh, rental units or stuff like that because they're quick, easy, cheap, and they last. They last a good 10, 15 years, right? Yeah, which absolutely. Is, which, is, which is good, yeah. Okay, I think we got another question here. Um, mm, mm, mm. Oh, I guess we're saying last call for the contest. So again, uh, Jerry's giving away free cabinet handles for your kitchen um, from- uh, Marathon. Oh, yeah, from Marathon. So. To enter into the draw, just, you need to enter the city in which Iconic Cabinets builds their cabinets. They're locally <laughs> made. They're one of the only cabinet shops in Edmonton that actually produces their own cabinetry. In fact, Iconic produces cabinets for a bunch of other cabinet shops out there. So uh, you might not even know you might have Iconic Cabinets in your home just under someone else's uh, moniker. So anyhow, how's that for a big old clue? <laughs> All right. So in about five more minutes, we'll we'll announce the winner. Uh, until then, if there's any questions, fire away. We're happy to help you out. Um, Jerry, do you want to just in case we do lose you on your on the call here? How can someone get a hold of you if they have questions about your product or about a kitchen design? Well, you can give their office a call at seven eight zero four two eight nine six six three, or you can call myself, or you can get a hold of even Paul, like almost anybody. Just uh, look online, iconic cabinets. I try to be, uh, I have a pretty good presence online, so. Yeah, if you could just post your office number in the comments, Jerry, that sure. people can pick that up later. Um, if you are planning your kitchen pro project and you don't know where to start, it's a bit overwhelming and I know it can be. Um, you know, you're welcome to call our office. I'm happy to talk to you. I'll give you some advice about things to consider um, send me some pictures. You don't need to hire us to do your kitchen. I mean, if you want to, sure, I'd be happy to work with you. Uh, but if you just want some advice, you know what? I think uh, we all need to help each other out. So you can call my office, 780-455-4446. Um, and we can set up a time for a call. We can do a video call and you can show me what you have to work with. And from there, you know, we can give you some advice. And then if 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 it rolls into us, want, you want us to do a design, then I can reach out to Jerry and we can do a design for you and, uh, you know, we can go from there. Some projects you can take on on your own. You don't need a general if it's very simple. And I'll tell you that straight up. If you don't need me, I'm not going to make you use me. Um, I'm not going to pretend you do need me. So just reach out, ask the question, and we're happy to help out. Okay, so last call on the draw. Where are iconic cabinets made? It's not Calgary. Tell you that much. <laughs> All right, hold on a sec here. Oh, look at this! The winner is Lauren Hunt. Ah, is the perfect. winner of some new cabinet handles. <laughs> well, congratulations, Lauren. Yep, I'll give you a call. We'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> So I guess moving forward, I should probably clarify that it has to be in Edmonton. Otherwise, it gets a lot more harder to pick up the prize. But <laughs> well, they could always come in. Yeah. yeah. And you have a showroom, right, Jerry? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So how does it work now for getting into the showroom? If they want to see your products and different samples, how does well, that I work? Have, I put the address online there on the comments. Okay. So it's uh, just off of White Mud 91. Okay. And uh, you go in there, you have... Pick the sample you like, the door you like, the handles you like, the, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you can actually try out and see if you like it. Okay. So. And are there limitations for access now with all this COVID stuff happening or how do they you, set up? You have time? to call ahead, but uh, realistically, we don't have uh, uh, people just walking in. So the doors are always unlocked, but just give me a call ahead of time. We meet, we follow the COVID uh, rules, you know, six foot distancing, uh, if you're sick, don't come. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stay home. But uh, 
if you're if you're healthy, come stay six feet, wear a mask uh, if need be. Uh, if you have kids and stuff, talk to me. We can make arrangements for that as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And for those of you that are considering projects now, I think that you know we've all kind of landed on how we're going to offer services in the midst of COVID. So we do have protocols in place to help keep everyone safe. Um, you know, we have specific questionnaires, all the trades need to answer before they can enter into our clients' homes. So, you know, we are still operating. Um, it's a, kind of a new normal, but uh, we can still do it. We've started a few different projects in the last couple of weeks, and uh, we can help with the planning side of things to make sure we can safely uh, work with you. Right. And again, we're doing a lot of video conferencing with potential clients now to help with the design packages that we offer. So, you know, we can do a little video, whether it's FaceTime call or Skype or Zoom or WhatsApp, um, pretty flexible that way. Then we can, you give us a tour of the home and we can give you design ideas. And it's an easy way to start the process without getting face to face, so to speak. And then once it gets a bit further along, we can, we can come on in there and, uh, and get the, get the work uh, started. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, anything else you want to add, Jerry? Final no. thoughts? You got a joke, I, joke of the day? No joke of the day. <laughs> right, I'll give you my son's joke from yesterday. He's, uh, he's in kindergarten. He did a joke for his uh, school. What did the zero say to the eight? What do you say? Nice belt. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sorry, dad jokes on the Art Renovation Live. <laughs> Anyhow, well, thanks so much, Jerry. Great to have you back on the show. I will make sure I record it this time so we can uh, we can post it afterwards. You can find it on our YouTube channel uh, if you want to reference any of our videos. Every week we do an interview with a different trade, uh, find ways that we can help you, give you advice. And if you're planning to do your own project yourself, fantastic. We can help give you some guidance. If you need a contractor, that's what we're here for as well. We're, we're happy to give you a hand with your project. So. Uh, Jerry from Iconic Cabinets, thanks again. It's always a pleasure to work with you and great to have you on the show. Thanks for uh, having me. You're very welcome. I'm Paul from Contact Renovations. This is the Art of Renovations Live. We'll see you next Tuesday at one o'clock. All right. See you, Paul. Have a great day. Bye-bye.